Hello and behind me is a Vickers VC-10 Super, which was a long haul, narrow body airliner built by the British in the 1960s. 54 of them were made and this is one of them. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a detailed tour. First, we're gonna walk around in the rain and I'll show you what's unique and interesting. And then we're going to crawl inside uh, and have a look at the cabin and the flight deck. So let's get into it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. These include guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and reviews of flights across the world. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the British Airliner Collection within the Duxford Imperial War Museum for letting me film this aircraft. I'll include a link to them in the video description below and more videos from their collection are coming soon. BOAC had ordered Boeing 707s and while they were great aircraft, their biggest problem was the lack of power which was exaggerated in airports with hot weather and higher altitudes. The Comet 4 was more powerful but couldn't carry enough passengers, so BOAC needed something else so Vickers put together the VC-10, which was later grown into this aircraft, the Super VC-10. It was more powerful, could carry more passengers, yet also operated at smaller and rougher airports. It had a very unique design where all four engines were right at the back, which we'll look at shortly. Zooming in on the forward landing gear, you'll see that the tyres have this ridge moulded into the sidewall. Standard sidewalls like you see on the main landing gear could send water back along the side of the aircraft and then into the rear mounted engines, so these ridges would help deflect the water outwards. The Boeing 727, which also had rear mounted engines, had a similar setup. Now because the engines were remounted and not underneath the wings in pods, the whole aircraft could sit lower making it easier for the ground crew to access the luggage hold, as you can see here. Unfortunately though, accessing the engines specifically was a much more difficult prospect. Let's talk more about the wing, and you'll notice that there is this ram air intake for the air conditioning system. This here is the inboard wing fence, which has two purposes. Firstly, it ensures that the air moves over the wing in a straight line rather than being tempted to move towards the side, which could cause the entire wing to stall. Secondly, they noticed when the aircraft was at high angles of attack, so the nose was high up in the air, the onboard engines would be starved of air. Therefore, the fence helped generate a vortex over the wing route, which kept the air moving towards those inboard engines. There's two smaller wing fences further along the wing, which you can just make out here. Because of the requirement to operate this at smaller airports, lower takeoff and landing speeds were needed, so the wing had to generate a lot of lift. By moving the engines away from it, it allowed them to fit full length leading edge slats and wide fowler flaps on the trailing edge which no longer needed brakes in them for the engine or the exhaust. Now the wing tip is interesting. There's no winglets like you see in modern aircraft as they didn't know of the benefits back then. Early prototypes had a squared off wing tip but the tip vortex was much stronger than thought so they had to install these large radius curves known as the Cuckman tips, and I'm sure I've pronounced that incorrectly, so comment below with the correct pronunciation. These here are canoes, which are simply aerodynamic covers for the flap mechanism. Now let's have a look at the main landing gear. Again, because there's no engines under the wing, the whole aircraft is lower, thus allowing for smaller landing gear struts. This allows for smaller wheel wells, so the valuable space can be used for other important things like fuel and cargo. The wheels themselves are fairly large and they also use low pressures inside of them to help absorb the impact when operating at more remote airports with rough runways. During the development, they also moved the whole landing gear towards the aft end to avoid it falling over backwards and it also reduced the risk of tail strikes during takeoff. Let's move back and talk about these engines. It was powered by Rolls-Royce Conway turbofans, which was actually the first ever turbofan to enter production. This really was back when the British were at the forefront of aviation design. Four were needed to provide enough thrust, especially at warmer and higher altitude airports within the British Empire, such as Karachi or Nairobi, because the 707 all struggled here. Four engines also provided comfort when flying over water. Remember that it wasn't until many decades later that aircraft with only two engines were allowed to fly far from land. I've already mentioned several advantages of rear mounted engines, including the aerodynamic benefits for the wing and the lower fuselage, but it also created a much quieter cabin as the noise was all towards the rear. The higher placement also reduced the risk of ingesting foreign bodies, which was especially a risk at more remote airports once again. 
locating them closer to the fuselage also reduced the problem of asymmetric thrust, with an engine failure which also meant that the tail fin wouldn't need to be as large. With the Super VC-10 upgrade, an extra fuel tank was installed inside the fin, thus increasing range. The engines were also twisted slightly, moved 11 inches outboard and a little upwards. This was to resolve buffeting and fatigue issues caused by the thrust reverses, but it didn't completely resolve the problem so the inboard engine thrust reverses had to be removed, leaving them on the outboard engines only. But the military version did keep the extra reverses, as I guess the crews were thought to be less unsettled by the buffeting than the general public. You can see the reverse vent here, and there was another one on the upper side of the engine as well. They discovered early on that the downward thrust could actually lift the rear of the aircraft a little, thus making the main landing gear brakes far less effective, hence another reason to twist the engine so that the thrust was directed a little sideways. Each engine produced around 22,500 pounds each, which for comparison's sake was over double the thrust of the Rolls-Royce Avens in the Comet 4. They powered it to a maximum speed of over 930 kilometers an hour or 580 miles an hour. In fact, it was the fastest airliner to cross the Atlantic Ocean up until the arrival of Concorde. Of interest, there's a single large beam which extended through the fuselage to support the four engines. It was made from a 1,344 pound block of S99 high tensile steel, but after 500 hours of milling, it was reduced to just 140 pounds. It's pretty incredible when you consider that the weight of the four engines was nothing in comparison to the incredible thrust they developed and the stress that would have been transferred to the fuselage to move it forward. As was the norm back then, it did not come with an auxiliary power unit, so it was reliant on ground power units to provide pneumatic pressure. But if that wasn't available, at even more remote airports, one of the starboard engines, usually number three, was fitted with a combustion starter. There was a small chamber which could have high pressure air blown in to it from an external bottle, and with fuel and ignition, the engine would turn over. It's similar, I guess, to the cartridge starters used in early jets. I should mention that the military version did have an APU installed in the tail cone, though. As you can see, there's quite a large T-tail design with the tail plane lifted well above the exhaust of the engine. For with the super upgrade, a fuel tank was installed inside the fin. Again, the Brits really were at the forefront of aviation design and the VC-10 came with an advanced quadruplicated automatic flight control system that was designed to allow for zero visibility landings. This was especially useful in the United Kingdom where the weather isn't always great. While it seemed to work reasonably well, it wasn't trusted by pilots and rarely used, so it was eventually removed with the Super VC-10 upgrade. Another disadvantage of the engines being rear-mounted is that the underwing engines would tend to oppose the pressure that would lift the wing and bend upwards during flight. Because there was none of these, essentially counterweights, under the VC-10's wing, it had to be more solid and therefore heavier than other similar aircraft like the 707's wing. You may have noticed the BOAC Cunard text on the outside. As the interest in passenger ships across the Atlantic declined, Cunard hoped that they could get into the aviation industry. From 1962 until 1966, the two companies worked together until cost increased and BOAC bought out Cunard shares. Now let's head inside this fascinating aircraft. We'll check out the cabin and return to the cockpit afterwards. Now maybe it's the bright colours, but it really felt spacious for a narrow body aircraft. Looking up, you can see where the life raft was stored. We're in the first class section here, well forward of the noisy engines, and the seats are in a 2-2 layout. You may notice that the shapes of this artwork are a map of the world, and moving around again, you'll see that there's all the modern comforts, including overhead individual air vents and reading lights. Then moving further back, we enter the economy section. The original VC-10 could seat 135 passengers in a two-class configuration, although later on BOAC ordered 109 seat interiors with more first-class seats. Eventually, Vickers realised that more seats were needed, so the Super VC-10, which is what this aircraft is, was planned with more powerful Conway engines. The fuselage was extended initially by 8.1 metres, but that was later revised to 3.9 metres, which allowed it to fit in 212 seats, which more importantly was around 20 more than the Boeing 707-320. But again, BOAC wanted more first-class seats, so it was reduced to a total of 163 seats. 
Now, before the first aircraft was delivered to BOAC, the airline reduced their orders and the government had to step in and order some for military transports. All of the negative press surrounding this and BOAC losing interest in an aircraft that was designed specifically for them eroded confidence in the whole project. Now, this here is a periscope. Sometimes a crew will want to look at the engines in flight, and an obvious disadvantage of them being remounted is that they can't just look out of the windows. So these periscopes can be put up through a hole just above here. It could also be mounted underneath the aircraft to check the status of the landing gear and above the cockpit through the same hole as the navigator sextant. And finally, it could look down into the cargo hold as well. There was no fire suppression system in there, but it was airtight, so the fire suppression plan was to allow the fire to essentially run out of oxygen. This could then be used to confirm the presence of a fire if the detection system is activated or if it has been extinguished. Another quite bizarre feature was the thrust augmenters. The aircraft was pressurized by a constant feed of air from four Godfrey compressors mounted on the engines, and the cabin pressure was regulated by outflow valves. You can see these outflow valves here. Someone decided that this was a waste of energy so the flight engineer could flick a switch and this air would then be directed to two other valves angled rearwards thus providing some forward thrust. To me it would seem like a negligible amount as the valves aren't very large but it's fascinating nonetheless. Another thing is that a fifth engine pod could be installed under the wing around this location, which enabled it to carry an engine out to a stricken aircraft at a remote location that needed a new one. Remember that they used the first ever turbofan engine, so reliability wasn't as impressive as it is these days. Here we are in the cockpit with a crew of four. The navigator was on the left, two pilots in the front and a flight engineer on the right. What stands out is how spacious it really is, especially if you compare it to the Comet 4 in that video. The dials are all analog and there's certainly no screens, although there is a weather radar display which is hidden behind the captain's chair. Of interest, after takeoff, the engines were managed by the flight engineer. As you can see, he had his own set of throttles. In fact, other than very basic information such as the RPM, the pilots don't see any other engine parameters. The fuel system, hydraulics, de-icing and many other controls were all operated by the engineer. You'll also notice that it's painted in light green. Now it's not as strong as the green seen inside Soviet cockpits, but I've read it two explanations. Either it's meant to be slightly calming, or it's a more neutral colour allowing crew's eyes to easily adjust from the cabin to the view outside the window. While the aircraft wasn't popular with airlines, the crews loved them, especially due to their great performance. Only 54 of these were ever built, although a double-deck Type 1180 version was in the very early stages of planning with two levels, with six across seating, up to 295 passengers, but this never eventuated. I mentioned earlier that the RAF took delivery of the VC-10C1, which was based on the standard VC-10 fuselage, but with the Super's wings, engines, and fuel tank in the fin. A large side cargo door was installed, an APU in the tail cone, 150 rearward facing seats and in-flight refueling. Later on, more were converted to K2 and K3 standard in-air refuelers and these operated until 2013. BA started retiring the Super VC-10s in the 1980s and the whole fleet was gone by the end of the following year. Most of them were sold to the RAF as no other airlines wanted them. The fuel consumption was a problem, but ground noise levels were the final nail in the coffin, and while hush kits were considered, it wasn't economically feasible. I hope you enjoyed the video, and please check out my channel for many other similar guided tours around interesting aircraft. Thanks for watching.